I'd like to welcome you all to uh, Out West at the Autry today. Uh, my name is Gregory Hinton. I'm the consulting uh, producer for Out West at the Autry. And before, we go, uh, before we go any further, if you could all turn off your cell phones now, because I'm going to just uh, say a few opening things, and then I'm going to have the privilege of introducing Dr. Carolyn Brucken, who's the chief curator here at the Autry. Um, it was about two years ago that I met Patricia Nell Warren uh, in the Autry's beautiful Western Film Gallery, and I'm hoping you'll all go into the gallery after, after the book signing. Um, and they call it the, the Imagination Gallery, and this was for the emotional installation of the iconic intertwined shirts worn by Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal in Brokeback Mountain. And what was remarkable also about this event for us is that it was hosted by Mrs. Jean Autry herself. Now, the public response to this event caught us all by surprise, and this prompted the Autry to develop a series of programs, lectures, films, plays, gallery exhibitions, uh, designed to highlight the contributions of our community to the history and culture of the American West. And we decided to call the program Out West at the Autry. Well, we started with one program in 2009. We had five programs in 2010. This year we have 12 programs in five different states, uh, and this is all thanks to uh, the generosity of our sponsors, starting with the Autry National Center, Tom Gregory, HBO, the David Bonnet Foundation, James Hormel's Small Change Foundation, and the Guild Foundation. Um, next year we're hoping to double that number of programs around the United States. When the Autry placed the Brokeback shirts on display, and accepted the archives of the International Gay Rodeo Association into their permanent rodeo collection in the Autry Library, the Autry became the first Western Art Museum in the United States to invite our community inside to tell our stories, and I'd like to give them a, a hand for that. When, when Patricia Nell Warren and I traveled to our home state of Montana, which I'm sure she'll discuss uh, uh, hopefully more at length, uh, last week for the book launch of her 10th book, My West, I carried with me a message from Jackie Autry to be read at the Bozeman Public Library, and this is what she sent for me to read. The Autry National Center is dedicated to telling the comprehensive story of the American West, and the Out West program is a full partner in this epic narrative. My husband, Jean, wanted a museum which represented all the people of our country, and we are extremely proud to have begun Out West, and now even more excited to share it with the great citizens of Bozeman and Montana. Now, many of you attended our uh, Out West Hidden Histories event, and I'm sure you met Dr. Carolyn Brucken, who is the chief curator here at the Autry, uh, when she lectured on the contributions of Southwestern photographer Laura Gilpin. And this was in the highly acclaimed exhibition, Homelands, How Women Made the West, which Dr. Brucken co-curated at the Autry. It's, uh, it's a, a privilege to have you uh, introduce Car uh, uh, Patricia uh, here today, Carolyn, thank you. And, I just would like to say lastly that during a time when the California State Legislature has to debate whether to allow LGBT history and culture to be taught in our schools, what the Autry has started without West is historic, but it's also very, very important. And I'm going to urge you to please support the museum. Uh, become a member of the Autry today, or go get a cup of their good chili, or go into the gift store and buy some cards. But uh, what we're doing here is historic and the partnership of the Autry um, has opened doors to all of these other venues around the United States for us. Um, sharing our stories, shining a light on our culture, staking our claim on the mother load of Western American history, this is the mission of Out West. Dr. Carolyn Brucken. Good afternoon. So I said, my name is Carolyn Brackett, and it's very much my pleasure to be able to welcome you on behalf of the Autry to the first of our presentations in the 2011 Out West series, and especially to welcome Patricia Nell Warren, our future presenter, back to the Autry. As Gregory mentioned, I had the pleasure of first meeting Patricia last year as part of the Autry's Thin History Program, 
where she brought the stories of the GLBT community to life to overflowing crowds in our galleries. My one regret was because I was participating in the program, was I wasn't able to sneak away and actually listen to her. So I'm very glad to um, have her back today. When she returns to read from her most recent publication, titled My West, a collection of essays in part inspired by the Out West series, and also drawn from her very long and distinguished career as a writer. Many of us are familiar with Warren as the author of eight highly successful novels, including the groundbreaking The Front Runner, first published in 1974. <laughs> Many of you may also be familiar with Warren as an essayist and a journalist whose work has appeared at everything from the Right Reader's Digest to the Huffington Post. Some of you may even know her as the co-founder of the Wildcat Press and important civil rights activist. But to add to all these accomplishments, this new collection reveals Warren to be just as accomplished as a Western historian as she is a writer. And that should be no surprise, really. Patricia Nell Warren has deep roots in the West and its many heritages. The great-granddaughter of Conrad Coors, she grew up on her family's ranch, the historic Grant Coors Ranch near Deer Lodge, Montana, which was one of the first ranches established in the Pacific Northwest, and which is now an historical site. That personal connection to the West runs throughout this new collection. As Warren successfully reaches into the historical past, and also reflects on contemporary issues of the West, without ever losing <coughs> sight of its people, and sometimes even its animals and its plants, and their stories. As a writer, Patricia Nell Warren's My West offers us a vision of the West as still a place of frontiers. Although, to quote the author, the frontiers today are the economic, political, social, and environmental horizons that our country is crossing. The Autry is a place about frontiers, and it is also a place about telling stories, unexpected stories, true stories. And so it is my pleasure and privilege to turn the stage over to one of our master storytellers today. Please welcome Patricia Nell Warren. stories at the dinner table. A lot of the stories I heard when I was really too young to understand what I was hearing. I was uh, two years old, three years old in my high chair and I was a very contrary kid. Uh, sometimes I would turn my cereal bowl upside down over my head and not pay attention to the stories that my dad and my mom were telling. They were both wonderful storytellers. My mother specialized in stories about her Irish ancestors going back to fighting the British in Ireland and coming on up through the Irish relatives who were in the Western railroading movement. And my dad telling stories about his side of the family, his grandfather, Conrad Coors, his great-granduncle, John Bielenberg, who was Coors' lifetime partner in the cattle business, and the neat thing about my parents was that in spite of a long, hard day of working on the ranch, they were never too tired to tell stories. My dad would come in after a cold day on the tractor in the beating wind and sun, and all he needed was to splash his face and a clean shirt and sit down to a good meal, and the, the, the storytelling chip would kick in, and everybody would start telling stories. And finally, by the time I was six or seven years old, I, I was paying attention. There's something about a good story, a beginning and a middle and an end that engages you and get, it gets your attention no matter how old you are. Mm -hmm. So often the stories, there might be a moral of the story there. There might be something that a kid should pay attention to. My dad, for instance, had one story that he told many times over the years about an encounter that he had with a ghost at one point when he was, uh, and he made no bones about it, he said that's what it was. Uh, one night when he was making a long ride when he was quite young, somewhere in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm. And the point of the story was not to be afraid, but to keep an open mind and to just really think about what it is that you're engaged with. <clears throat> 
He might have stories about how Uncle Johnny Bielenberg dealt with fractious colts. Or he might come in and say, oh my golly, we got struck by lightning today when we were out bailing hay. <laughs> but whatever the story was, it was really something that you wanted to listen to if you were a kid. And sooner or later, my, my brother and I got old enough to charm in with, chime in with our own stories. And we were expected, our stories were listened to, nobody put us down because we were kids and didn't want to hear our little kid stories about what happened to us at school that day or out on the ranch feeding the chickens or whatever. The important thing about the stories, one of the things that I learned, and it, it took me some years to see the importance of oral tradition and the sense in which it is so absolutely true in spite of the fact that it isn't written down and sometimes it might be a little hazy about dates but when you think about it for a minute, my dad was talking about hearing stories from the old man, Grandfather Kors, and his, his, uh, his, his granduncle, who had been born in the 1830s. And my great-grandmother, Augusta Kors, was still alive at that time. So until I was eight years old, I had the opportunity to talk with her and to hear from her about seeing the railroads appear in Europe for the first time where before that she and her family had had to travel by awful jolting stagecoach along muddy roads and she could remember hearing about Napoleon and she could remember being at <coughs> the Danish court when her father who was a court musician took her to visit. So if you think about it for a minute and you do the math, today we're in 2011 and I'm 75 and I'm talking to you today about these things and by virtue of the people that I talked to and my, my family talked to, we're talking about a personal connection of almost 200 years from 2011 back into the 1830s. That's a long time and it's a great and wonderful time for stories to be passed from generation to the next and for us to realize the important information that these stories carry, whether it's to be not afraid or whether it's simply uh, a question of how things were done. One of the stories that my dad told over a number of times was the story about the Indian mounds that were out in one of the pastures. And so I'm gonna read just a little short section from my West about this story. When I was a kid, aged 10 years or so, I used to climb on my cow pony and went my way to a pasture that the family called the 80. It stretched across a big prairie on the east side of the state highway. On the white man's record books, the 80 had started out as an 80-acre desert claim taken up by my great-grandfather Conrad Kors. Out of that gravelly prairie, six or seven low mounds rose like gentle waves from some geological deep. They were greened over by native short grasses and sage that made gentle whistling sounds whenever the wind blew strong across them. You couldn't miss the mounds. They looked like they didn't belong there. Often I got off my horse and sat there on the biggest mound, chewing on a stem of grass and listening to the sound of wind in the sage. The world was still very quiet in those days, right after World War II. As yet, there were no commercial jets flying overhead, trailing their blue thunder nor did any huge 16-wheeler trucks roar by on the highway. From the distant town, I might hear a faint whistle from a steam engine on the Northern Pacific switching yard. Or perhaps, if it was noon, the siren at City Hall would crank up to tell everybody in town that it was time to go home for lunch. Other than that, the prairie was quiet, quiet. Now and then, a long-billed curlew ran through the grasses with its mournful cry of, ee, 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 for me, for me. Nearby, a colony of prairie dogs had built their own little mounds, and one or two of them might be standing guard there, keeping an eye on me and chucking warily. I wondered and wondered about the mounds. According to my father, this was a place where the tribes once stopped to pray when they traveled through the valley in the fall on their way to hunt buffalo east of the mountains. He'd heard this from the old men of the family, 
his grandfather Coors, and his great granduncle John Bielenberg. In his own childhood, he had felt drawn to the mounds too. Dad told me that he remembered poking around over them and finding hunks of decayed old buffalo skulls buried in the grass, splintered horns, weathered eye sockets, with vestiges of red and blue paint still on them. According to him, his old Uncle Johnny had told him that the people always said thanks for a good hunt by leaving the painted skulls there. So I wondered, who built the mounds? How long had they been there? Hundreds of years, like some people said, about the medicine wheels around the west? Or were they just natural heaps of gravel and dirt left behind by glaciers, perhaps? that the tribes had adopted for their prayers. Back at the house, nosing into books in the family library, I found archaeologists and scholars who stated in authoritarian tones that, quote, American Indian mound culture can only be found in the Mississippi Valley. But other books I found later would make mention of mounds in Western North America, clear north into Canada. Clearly, the experts didn't agree on the wares and why fors of mounds. Why had great-grandfather taken up a desert claim right there when he could have grabbed land from anywhere near the ranch buildings? Was he protecting that spot somehow? He had been friends with the white and mixed-blood stock raisers who first settled in the Deer Lodge area in the early 1800s. All of them had Indian wives that he knew. Why did this spot seem so familiar and dear to me, as much my heritage as clapboard churches in New England or Greek temples in Europe? Why did I feel like praying there myself? Why did the wind sometimes sound like little voices talking to me, right there buried in the grasses, yet too far away for the words to be heard? So here's another important thing about the stories. They raise questions. They don't answer questions necessarily. And a kid who is imbued with the stories, you begin to think, you begin to question, you begin to dig into things in your mind, and the stories send you on journeys. And for me, the questions became a really important part of becoming who I am today, and I'm still on that journey. But I realized that the questions in lots of ways are more important than the answers. And so there came a time Later on, 12, 13 years old, as I began to discover that there was something called sex <laughs> that people had, <laughs> and it was funny how ranch people talked very casually about the private parts of animals <laughs> and the sex that goes on on the ranch, but people sex was a whole different thing, and in, in the 1940s, of course, people didn't talk about it all that much, <clears throat> but you became aware that it was there. And I began to realize that I was somehow different from other people. And, of course, in the 1940s and 50s, there was no language to talk about this. There simply were no words. I now and then heard the word queer used about people, but, you know, silly me, little country kid who only knew about private parts of animals, I had no idea what people were talking about when it came to humans. And so, there began the process of discovery of human stories that, sadly enough, I wouldn't hear till much later. And so the stories really had to start with me because nobody else was telling them. So I'm going to read a little section from a piece later on in the book that's titled Grass, Girl Grassroots that was originally published in the Lesbian News in June 1994. When I was eight years old, I fell in love with Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> During the 1944 presidential campaign, Eleanor and Franklin D. Roosevelt rode their campaign train through my Montana town. I didn't care about him. I wanted to see her. <laughs> I was squeezed in the crowd, waving wildly, being trampled by adults, 
Finally, my dad got me up on his shoulder so I could see. There she was on the platform of the last car with her funny hat, her buck teeth, and her shy, brave eyes. She was standing beside FDR in his wheelchair. She waved back. Surely she was waving at me. <laughs> Even on the playground, kids argued for Roosevelt or Dewey. When they laughed at Eleanor's buck teeth, I slugged them in the mouth. <laughs> my parents were surprisingly tolerant of my tomboy exploits, even though I broke lances for Eleanor, and they broke them for Dewey. <laughs> my parents were humanist Republicans who owned as many miles of bookshelves as barbed wire fences. They sent me to Presbyterian Sunday school, but never propagandized me about church. The family tree was loaded with Irish rebels and democracy-minded Germans. Our Native American branch was tinier, starting with Cherokees in colonial times. I was surrounded by big animals, tractors, guns, leather, and men. My dad, my marine uncle, my brother Conrad, cowboys, veterinarians, hunters, livestock auctioneers. The women I knew best were my mother and a few ranch girls like myself. There was no TV in my world, nothing to hold a child's imagination hostage, as electronic empires do today. In the Powell County grade school, every student had to read a book a week. One day, English teacher Jane Jordan held up Robinson Crusoe and talked about something called verisimilitude. Mr. Defoe helped pioneer verisimilitude, she said. It is a writer's trick, one that makes the book seem real. I was fascinated by this idea and put it to work in my next short story. By the time I was 13, some of my favorite authors were Willa Cather, Mari Sandoz, Margaret Mitchell, Frank Baum, Winston Churchill, are you liking the mix here? <laughs> Oscar Wilde, Mark Twain, Frank Bird Linderman, T.E. Lawrence, and of course, Eleanor Roosevelt. My reading showed me that many different galaxies of human feeling shine within the far-flung universe of humanity. Those pre-TV heroes were freedom fighter types. Today's children cause pacifists to weep as they idolize fighters. But children need to love fighters. Children are so easily bashed that they need to know they can fight back. Eleanor's This Is My Story told of her shy, tortured girlhood and her growth into a fighter for human rights. In 1946, when Gone with the Wind came back to town on a rerun, every town dug into her mom's, her, dug her mom's 1920s chiffon flapper dresses out of the trunk in the basement. At slumber parties, we got ourselves up in Civil War drag, and the prettiest girls fought to be Scarlett O'Hara. But my broad-shouldered frame simply burst those wispy dresses. Somebody had to play Red Butler. <laughs> 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 and that's somebody who stayed. 